Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Marco Marinucci from Mandebridge, and today we have the pleasure of uh, talking to Dennis Clark, a senior managing director of Honda Innovations. Hi, Dennis. How are you doing? Hi. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. My pleasure. And this is actually part of the chats that uh, we're recording uh, associated with the launch of the new report of the innovation outpost of uh, Japanese corporates here in Silicon Valley. And clearly Honda uh, being one of the major, most visible players there uh, is definitely a case study that we wanted to highlight. And that's the reason and the topic of uh, the day. So uh, Dennis, great to uh, have you there. Why I would start with the, uh, your background, uh, your job role in general, but even more, even before that, uh, I was, uh, you know, very interested in the very diverse background that you have. Uh, I think born and raised in U.S., but started working with Japan pretty early. You also have a background in economic development. You work at UNESCO for some time, then banking, and then you ended up in the, in the world of venture. So um, tell us and share a little bit of your professional path. Sure, yeah. Uh, so my career path to Honda is, as you mentioned, a bit uh, untraditional. Uh, after finishing my undergrad in, in finance in the United States, I spent the first decade of my career uh, living and working in Asia, uh, primarily in Japan, uh, including uh, work in banking and a brief period, as you mentioned, uh, in international civil service. Uh, I returned to the U.S. in 2007 uh, and joined a boutique early stage venture capital firm investing in Silicon Valley in Asia, uh, primarily a firm that had most of the LPs were Japanese investors, hence the, the Jap Japan connection. Um, did that for about five years. Uh, and in 2012, I learned that Honda was expanding uh, its team in Silicon Valley. Uh, at the time I'd observed that consumers, this was 2012, were using their smartphones uh, in place of the infotainment system, often they paid thousands of dollars for, uh, using their smartphones for navigation, infotainment. Um, and there were, at the time, I guess, a few Google self-driving cars on the road. And I had an inclination that automotive uh, and venture and innovation might be an interesting place to be. Um, but I had no idea uh, how much things would change uh, in a short time span. A couple of years after I joined Honda, mobility investment as a category really took off and went from having a handful of deals and interesting startups to look at every month to literally a period of time where we were meeting four to five new transportation focused startups daily. Uh, I've always been passionate about going back to, as a kid, uh, cars and automotive and transportation. Uh, I lived in a number of urban environments and, and, and feel really strongly about urban mobility uh, and a need to innovate around that. And that's really what drew me uh, to this profession. Awesome. Um, and now you've been now in Silicon Valley for, what is it, eight years? Probably a little bit more by now, right? Yeah, about 12 years in total. Yeah, 12 years, yeah. Yeah, no, eight years probably at Honda. And before we, we go a little deeper on, uh, on the Honda Innovations as an entity, let's talk about Honda as a group, right? Uh, you know, very wide range of activities. Clearly, it's not just automotive. So give us kind of a, a glimpse of uh, how is Honda today structured and so maybe some numbers about Honda. Sure, of course. Um, so Honda is actually uh, over 70 years old as a company. Uh, we began as a, as a motorcycle company. That's where our history is. Um, so even today, we're the largest manufacturer of motorcycles in the world. Uh, but the largest... Uh, part of our business is in automotive. Um, and so we're, I think today, maybe the fifth or sixth largest automotive player. Um, we volume wise, we sell close to uh, 5 million vehicles per year uh, around the world. Um, and in addition to automotive and, and um, the two wheel business, uh, we have a pretty large power equipment business. So a lot of things were based around uh, many, going back many years, the internal combustion engine. So outboard engines, uh, generators, different types of power equipment. Uh, also, as of uh, three years ago, we launched a jet business, which has been quite successful. We have a small uh, corporate jet uh, that we sell uh, in small volume, of course. Um, and then, of course, Honda is very ambitious, and we have um, some interesting uh, products in the work in the robotics domain as well. Uh, so a very wide variety of products, a big product portfolio, uh, compared to a lot of the other companies in our sector. 
And so I'm sure with that kind of structure, the relationship that you have with the world of innovation is wide and uh, and 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 fo focus in different all the different verticals. But that's the that's kind of the journey that I would like to cover with you with the what today's. Uh, Honda innovations and all the different kind of steps and, and development. Also, I would like to talk about the future because in our previous talk, you know, you did mention that you are at an important junction of, uh, of, uh, of what's next. So maybe let's cover, you know, the history of Honda, Honda innovation as it started in Silicon Valley initially in 2005, if I remember correctly with a different name, but the activities that you guys were started doing in 2005 with a, with a fund actually, with a CVC, and then what evolved and brought you to what, what is the structure today? Sure, yeah, and actually, um, Honda's history in Silicon Valley begins even prior to 2005. So uh, to give you a little bit of context, we actually began with a very small fundamental research team uh, called Honda Research Institute, doing work primarily in computer science and collaborating with talented researchers at UC Berkeley and Stanford here in the Bay Area. Uh, we later added, as uh, you mentioned in 2005, a uh, corporate venture capital unit, a small corporate venture capital unit, and then an R&D team in 2011 as kind of the intersect between technologies that were being developed for the smartphone and the car became apparent. We added a small R&D team. Um, in 2012, we combined forces uh, and shifted our CVC to more of an open innovation team focused on collaborative hands-on work uh, not only with startups here in the Bay Area, but with large tech companies like Google, Apple, uh, and Microsoft. Um, in 2017, we again evolved uh, into our current iteration, which is uh, an independent standalone company called Honda Innovations. Uh, and so Honda Innovations is a product of all of our learnings uh, over time, uh, but it's basically the open innovation arm of Honda, headquartered here in Silicon Valley, uh, but operating globally. So we have uh, teams and, and people in North America, throughout North America, in Europe, China, and Japan, in different, what I'll call innovation ecosystems or hubs. Uh, we operate a bit of a hybrid model. Uh, so, you know, we spearhead collaboration with, I would say, 20 to 30 early stage startups uh, every year and do a handful of direct equity investments and strategic partnerships with really promising startups that we've been able to prove out their strategic value to the company. So I like the journey because it's very much in line with the number one, the way they were categorizing today, the outpost of innovations of open innovation here. And you, it seems like you did pretty much all the check all the boxes. We typically organize it either in R and D centers in outposts of innovation as an antenna or lab based on the size or a CVC. If it looks like in your journey, you you uh, you you went through all the different options. And mm -hmm. as our shirts that a t-shirt that we have Amanda Bridge uh, that we produce in the thousand evolve or be extinct. Say this, I think this is a good. Uh, you know, it's a good example of how smart companies today are really trying to evolve also in their model that uh, uh, wouldn't make sense to to be constant in the world of uh, innovation that is uh, changing in the structure and the K KPIs and the expectations as well. So a very good example of this journey and uh, love to hear a little bit more of also uh, of the lessons learned uh, uh, throughout that. That, that journey. But before that, uh, let's go a little deeper in the structure today of the sure. innovations, the, you know, the programs that you run, uh, the KPIs in particular. So what do you eventually count as a, you know, outcome? What has been, you know, a good year versus uh, uh, something that is harder to, um, to measure? So let's talk about that. Sure. So I guess first to touch on how we've uh, organized our activities, um, our public facing activities, so we've set up uh, two branded programs. The first is uh, called Honda Accelerator uh, with an X, not an A. Um, and Honda Accelerator is really an open innovation program designed to facilitate collaboration between startups and different business units inside of Honda. And the mission really is to facilitate long-term win-win collaborations. Um, the, the program is structured as such that it's not, um, it's, it's not, it won't have classes or cohorts. So we work with companies depending on their stage, depending on what type of technology or business innovation they're working with very differently. But at a high level, we provide uh, non-dilutive funding. So funding to work together with Honda to create proof of concepts, to integrate the technology 
into one of our products and demonstrate it to development teams. Uh, we have a variety of places, at least in a pre-COVID world, where our startups can sit and work side by side with us. Um, and this and is in we, Silicon Valley, right? The in Silicon Valley, Valley, we also have a location in Detroit, and we have the ability to host companies in other regions as well at Honda R&D facilities. Um, and we pair companies into the program with mentors, and these are mentors from inside of Honda uh, to allow the startup and uh, that we're working with to think about not just building a proof of concept or doing a pilot with Honda, but really understanding what it takes to get their technology to a level uh, to get it into production. Um, so again, we're not, our goal is not simply to create a POC or take an equity interest in a startup. We really seek out opportunities uh, that we can co-create a clear path to production. And that's really what the mentor uh, side of the, the house is for. Is that mostly seed stage or so early stage or, or sometimes you also accept companies that are a little bit further along in their development? Yeah, great, great question. So first, you know, for Honda, we, we spend billions of dollars in R&D. We have lots of people internally with great ideas. Um, so idea stage is not typically the types of companies we work with. We're looking for companies that have some type of minimum viable product that demonstrates something unique, potentially breakthrough. Uh, again, something that we're not developing internally or we're seeing from our supplier or partner network externally. Um, Give us some numbers also of, uh, you know, is that you're talking a dozen companies per year or, or more? Uh, well, actually, so there's different levels of things that we do. So hands-on companies that we work with directly in our Silicon Valley office, you know, probably 12 to, to 15. Uh, but globally, we're looking at about double that. And that's the other, I guess, learning that we've had over the last few years is that, you know, Silicon Valley is really no longer a place. It's a mindset. Um, and a lot of the venture investors that are active here are, are active in other regions and vice versa. And so we've really taken a global approach to innovation. And Honda's now asked us to do this again around the world because we never know where the next impactful startup or, or technology innovation is going to come from. And so when you um, filter and accept these companies, they're not necessarily from here. They, uh, is, is there also a percent of, uh, of those startups that are, that are you know, earth quarter somewhere else that are international? Yeah, great question. So we've done a lot of work with, I would say, uh, the, the, probably the, the region that we've done the most work in is actually Israel. Mm. As you're probably aware, Israel has a, a very robust uh, startup ecosystem around smart mobility and transportation. And so we actually have a um, incubator facility that we co-sponsor there and we do quite a bit of work with startups there, uh, Europe as well. And we've started over the last two years doing some work in China uh, with startups there. The, it's interesting because in our study that we're publishing, um, you know, together with the, those interviews of the structure of outpost uh, of innovations in Silicon Valley, we compare it with other ecosystems around the world and clearly, uh, you know, I mean, Israel is the probably the second most uh, relevant uh, and very comparable. So the overlap of companies and corporates that actually have both presence is uh, is is very high. Yeah. It's probably you know more than more than half of the large corporates have have both both uh, hubs uh, with some you know sp special focus in uh, uh, sometimes uh, that are is geographically um, you know associated, but it's definitely you know a, a, a model that we've seen evolving over the few years uh, more often than not. Can you give us a sense of the size of investments that you have for startups in in that process, and is that a defined term? So you you do a case by case based on uh, the interest, the the amount of co-development and and other variables. Yeah, so I guess there's two types of what we think of as investments. First, there's you know, NRE funded activities, where we're not taking a, this non-dilutive, we're not taking an equity stake. And those run the gamut of, you know, uh, small hundreds of thousands to, to much uh, larger, depending on the engagement and the level of a company that we're interacting with. Um, on the equity investment side, we don't have a dedicated fund. Uh, so everything is done kind of off balance sheet. And we go through an investment committee uh, in Japan. Um, but I can give you, I guess, a couple of, maybe this is a good point to give you a couple of success cases that we can yeah. talk about and walk you through a couple of partners that we've worked with and how those uh, relationships have evolved. Um, so the first I can uh, discuss is a company by the name of SoundHound. Uh, SoundHound is a well-known uh, startup in Silicon Valley, uh, later stage at this point, um, working on an intelligent agent uh, technology. 
And we actually began our work with SoundHound through Honda Accelerator as a small proof of concept in 2005. Uh, we expanded this into a co-development agreement uh, with our R&D headquarters in Japan. Uh, this was followed by a strategic investment uh, at the end of 2018 as we uh, began to work towards production with them. Uh, and just, I guess, at the end of last year, we announced that we're very happy to deploy SoundHound's technology uh, to power our Honda personal assistant feature in our upcoming Honda E, which is an electric vehicle that will launch in the European market. Uh, so I think it's a great example of, again, engaging with a company early uh, through POC and other types of co-development, then identifying uh, you know, a strong connection and strategic value making and an equity investment and then then moving it into a production. Uh, can, this, can, I, can I ask you yeah. a, a, a sub question there because it's a very critical when, when there's this, the co-development activities where the intellectual property resides and what are the strings attached to the co-development? What, what, what are your practices? Yeah, so again, this is, this is case by case. Um, and so in the case of uh, SoundHound, we've co-developed some, I would say, domains. Uh, if you know anything about the, the natural language understanding and voice space, we've co-developed some things together. But basically, it's deploying their technology uh, in our vehicles. There's not much um, joint IP that we have, have created. Uh, so it's pretty straightforward. Got it. Um, the second example that I'd uh, probably is a good idea to, to demonstrate our capabilities and, again, our process uh, is a collaboration we've done with a, a company called Drive Mode. Uh, and Drive Mode is another uh, Silicon Valley based company. It was an early stage uh, company uh, that had developed an app uh, for Android uh, and iOS to allow uh, customers to for, for allow people to use uh, certain features on their smartphone safely while driving. Um, and we began a collaboration with this company in 2005, looking at how we can use their technology uh, for our customers uh, using our two-wheel products, our motorcycles. Uh, we expanded our work with co-development, doing more work actually locally here in Silicon Valley with the company. And together we developed this human machine interface technology that allows our customers on motorcycles to interact with their smartphone content in a safe and convenient manner while operating uh, the vehicle. Uh, to internalize this innovation last year, uh, we basically, uh, acquired drive mode. Um, and this is Honda's first ever acquisition hmm. of a technology startup in the history of our company. Um, and we're slated to take that technology to production later this year, or early next. And so, and that's, and that takes me to the other very important topic that is how you guys integrate your activities with the different business units or parts of the group that are very different in, uh, in, 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 in focalization. What is the, in this case, the acquisition was through uh, Honda Motorcycle? Because uh, no, Honda, Honda, was... Honda Innovation is, is a company by itself, right? I mean, yeah, so the acquisition took pl uh, was done. Now uh, Drive Mode has become a, become a wholly owned subsidiary of our R&D, our global R&D company. Um, and so they're continuing uh, again to do R and D and iterate and, and, and push this product out. Um, so while we drove a lot of the, and, and that's typically the, the, um, timeline is we draw drive a lot of the activities internally, and then we hand off uh, to a business unit or a development team inside of the company, but it's very important. And this is what we've learned over time for us to stay involved and really what we call advocate for the innovator, advocate for the startup, because there's certain, you know, parts throughout a, an interaction collaboration with a startup, where as an automotive company, where most of our teams are primarily used to engaging with large suppliers, uh, we tend uh, for whatever reason to, to try to treat startups like suppliers. And we need to have uh, teams like ours to be able to step in and say, wait a second, guys, they have a different set of needs. Um, really, you know, let's think about how we structure things with them to make it a win-win. And so that's part of our process is staying involved with these successful collaborations and seeing them through. In terms of organization and organizational skills, uh, I think you're the, on the innovations around 40, 50 people, right? On, around that range, maybe 40 here in Silicon Valley and the rest outside of Silicon yeah, Valley. Yeah, that's correct. We have about 40 people. Um, we have uh, a team that we call our Venture Alliance Unit, which is basically a team of relationship management, people with kind of ex-venture, or incubation uh, experience. 
Um, we have an internal team of uh, technologists and engineers that can help us diligence um, technologies. And oftentimes there are people seconded from Japan with specific skill sets, or maybe autonomous systems, uh, human machine interface. Um, and then we have uh, a design team that helps us. In some cases, we need to add elements of design thinking to the uh, collaborations mm -hmm. that we're doing and the prototypes we're building. Uh, and then an operations team that helps us operate uh, our global program. And so in back to the comment you were making before, so uh, clearly the filtering happens internally, but then you always have a channel open with the different business units. And at what stage is time to engage and get a validation for the business unit? And is that run by those relationship managers that um, are fully engaged with, uh, I mean, in the, in the payroll of uh, on the innovations? Is there kind of a counterpart in the different business units of of uh, uh, departments that deal with innovation from, yeah. from different business units to you? There are, but we don't always listen to them uh, <laughs> to, in reality, and that's our job, right? So one of the things we, when we look at any type of, of startup uh, innovation, potential innovation, we think of in terms of, of, of two categories. The first is what we call plug-in, which basically mm -hmm. if, it's, if they're developing a technology, it's a plug-in to our existing roadmap. There are other, other opportunities that more of what we call moonshot, for lack of a better word, where it's actually not on the roadmap. It's something that our development teams haven't thought of. It's an over the top technology. And those are primarily, those moonshot related activities are driven by us because we're on the front lines. We understand uh, innovation. We can see things faster and from a different perspective than oftentimes our counterparts who are so, so focused on developing a product and not necessarily looking out uh, at potential threats or new opportunities that are emerging. Got it. Excellent. So this is the accelerator, and then there's another unit within uh, Honda Honda Innovation, correct? Correct. So the second uh, publicly facing program that we have is called Honda Developer Studio, and Honda Developer Studio was basically created to engage with the developer community, um, primarily around uh, CarPlay and Android Auto. These are two initiatives that we drove early on. Uh, together with Google and Apple uh, to enable smartphone connectivity in our vehicles. Um, and so they engage with companies that are looking to build apps and services uh, for kind of in-vehicle experiences, um, both large and small companies. Um, but a lot of the work they've done over the last few years is primarily uh, related to large companies. So doing work with uh, large companies around in-vehicle payments and allowing customers to, uh, from the head unit of their vehicle, uh, pay for different services, pay for gas, pay for uh, being able to go and pick up food and pay for that inside of the head unit, uh, tolls, this type of thing. Uh, so they've done a lot of, of work around creating prototypes and demonstrating uh, business viability and user experience uh, features, and then handing those off to internal teams inside of the company that are focused on, again, user experience and connectivity. It feels more like a, an ecosystem play here uh, of, you know, developer relationship for the lack of, of a better world. There, but there is no, you know, objective of creating or spinning, spinning out companies uh, in a kind of a, you know, company studios. What, what do you think about the companies to startup studios kind of model that, uh, that a few corporates are today testing? Yeah. So it's, it's not that. Um... You know, I, I, I tend to believe that, you know, corporates necessarily shouldn't be in the business of creating uh, companies on their own, that uh, the venture ecosystem and financially motivated investors uh, are, are best at doing that. Uh, and we should ride the wave and surf and look for opportunities uh, that those ecosystems create and add value where we can. Um, so I think there's plenty of, of you know, uh, accelerators and incubators uh, out there uh, for early stage companies. I don't necessarily feel that corporates need to get into that business. Yeah. Uh, we, we touched on it at the very beginning, but now that we have a, a, a better understanding of the structure, back to KPIs, right? And yes. I know Honda Innovations is a, is a company by itself, I mean, dedicated PNL, without maybe without going into the details, how is that PNL managed? But most importantly, how do you, what do you, at the end of the year, what do you actually measure? And again, yeah. just to finish, 
specifically when the open innovation units are uh, wide in wide range, one of the major topics for the large companies like yourself is really to understand what is the today the um, the support of the innovation activities, both at the, at the top line, so additional uh, revenues, or at the bottom line, so so better performance. How do you guys at Honda Innovation look at this? Yeah. Um, so in terms of KPIs, we you know use a typical funnel process. So uh, at the front of the funnel, we obviously track you know deals sourced, uh, things that have you know attracted interest of business units. Uh, we look at as as a KPI on an annual basis the number of again the collaborations that we've facilitated, um, different projects that we've done, things that have made it from POC to a next step uh, with with a business unit, and they've taken that over. That's another KPI. And then the longer term KPIs involve more transformational opportunities. So a couple of the opportunities I mentioned earlier, startup collaborations we've done that have actually gotten into a Honda product or service. And this obviously takes a little bit of time. Um, and then we have some kind of light qualitative, uh, mm. you know, ways of looking at learnings that we've gained over time in, in, in working uh, with innovators and startups and, and value that we've captured there. Um, and we, you know, we're evaluated on a quarterly basis um, and we report it on a quarterly basis, but Honda's pretty good at, at letting us, giving us freedom to roam and understanding that you know, innovation takes time and patience, um, you know, and, and not to sit and watch the pot pot cook, uh, but give it time to really simmer. Do the different business units see you as a, an antenna where, you know, sometimes also, you know, an informational trip can take place? We know that everybody here in Silicon yeah. Valley, we tend to, you know, be in a part of that, uh, at least pre, pre-coronavirus of a constant flow of uh, executives, managers that come here also for a short yeah. period of time, really to get a sense of where, where, where are the next big things? They do look to us now. Uh, that being said, when I joined Honda in, in 2012, it was quite a challenge. Um, you know, I think it, it didn't hurt that uh, there were companies, you know, that grew from very small uh, companies to large companies very quickly overnight in our domain or, or at least in mobility. Uh, you know, companies like Uber and Lyft uh, that were having an impact on our business or in adjacent businesses. Uh, this, you know, what was really interesting is historically, um, you know, venture investors haven't had a lot of interest in automotive and transportation. And that kind of changed in, in 2011, 2012 timing. And there was this flurry of, of activity uh, and lots of media and press around it. Um, and so that certainly helped uh, make the case for what we're doing is important. The other thing that we did that I think that I would recommend to, to companies that are new at this is early on, we realized that there was a gap between the understanding of what was happening on the ground here and the importance to our business and kind of things that were happening at our R&D headquarters in Japan or even places in North America. We did kind of road shows where we would you know, pick mm -hmm. the top 10, 15 startups that we'd seen that we think were interesting. Some of them were, you know, meeting needs that the, that the business units had. Some of them were more provocative, like the moonshots I mentioned earlier. And we'd pay to fly them uh, to in Japan or, or other R&D headquarters and, and just create um, events where people inside of Honda can interact with the startups. Mm. Um, and that's really stimulated, helpful. right? As you get as a, you know, open, open internal conversation. Yeah, you know, internal conversation. And this is what we'd have oftentimes, you know, our R&D headquarters in Japan has 15,000 people on our campus. And we did events where we'd have, you know, 1,000 people, 500 people come throughout the day wow. and interact with the startups. And that really helped us build a brand inside of the company and get them to understand that there are startups doing really interesting things. Conversely, it really, the it really paid off for the startups because they were able to interact directly with engineers working on specific problems, get feedback, uh, get new ideas on how their technology can be deployed. Um, so that was something we've done over time that has been really helpful and I think we'll continue to do. Um, and hopefully that's helpful to others that are, that are just starting down this road. Initially, when we thought about the amount of capital that we need to spend, mm -hmm. when you think about flying two representatives from you know, 15 companies to Japan and putting them up for a few days, you know, it, it's quite a, it's quite resource uh, consuming, but it was very helpful for us. And we actually uh, 
created a lot of projects out of those uh, early uh, opportunities that we uh, did. Let's talk about the development of the market. In this case, mobility at you know at a at a wide um, meaning of mobility um, that has been the the major focus I, I would assume of uh, Honda Innovations for the last few years. Uh, we are reaching a point. I mean, clearly here, mobility has been front and center here, meaning Silicon Valley in particular, front and center for a few years. There's a certain level of maturity that you guys recognized. And so I think this is driven you uh, to the next phase, right? Planning what is next. So you mentioned yeah. that you are at the tipping point. Maybe can you can you share some of your thoughts of, uh, you know, what is the, your, the value that you can add today? What How do you see the development of the mobility market? What's And what's the next thing? Sure. Yes, I think first of all, that's what we've, one of the things we've internalized and learned over time is that as an innovation group, we need to constantly evolve. Um, and I think, you know, today, many of us really feel that we're at this inflection point for, for Honda Innovations in terms of our focus. Uh, so uh, over the last seven to eight years, as you mentioned, uh, innovation in transportation really was the next big thing with billions of dollars going into early stage mobility startups. And of course, we're still in the early innings of this transformation. Uh, there's lots of problems to continue to be solved and new opportunities to be created. Um, however, we, we're seeing a pattern and what we feel is that mobility is really starting to mature as a category and there may be less startups for us to vet and collaborate with compared to the last few years. Um, and for some of these things uh, like you know autonomy and, and, and electrification and user experience, it's really the rubber hits the road. Now, you know, a select number of startups are getting follow on funding. They're working together with large partners and really trying to now productize some of this stuff. Um, so now Honda Innovations needs to consider really what the next chapter of our development and our mission for Honda is. Um, and this includes really, uh, you know, thinking creatively about how to unlock potential benefits of early stage innovation that we're seeing that is not directly related or adjacent to our business, our core business. Mm. Um, and in fact, actually the COVID situation today has further, further accelerated this kind of internal reflection uh, for us. Uh, we're really currently trying to grapple with the potential long-term structural changes, if any, that may occur and new consumer preferences uh, that may emerge uh, and around mobility and also outside of that and where the opportunities are for us. And without a doubt, I think startups will be at the forefront of creating new value around any new opportunities that will emerge from this, this crisis, if you will. Um, so one of the keys to our transformation as a company uh, lies in our ability to uh, adapt and collaborate with these new players that emerge successfully. So, you know, we're still, we're still, we don't have a clear picture yet, but mm -hmm. we're in fact finding mode. Is there any area that uh, goes beyond uh, what you just mentioned that you think that uh, you can internalize and also use the resources of Honda and some of the of the experience and the infrastructure of Honda as an added value also for yeah. you know to 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 industrialize some of sure. the new trends that are happening that you think that can be of uh, of interest. So energy is a is a big area of interest for us, and obviously energy and mobility are are strongly interlocked. Um, so that's an area that we're we're looking at uh, deeply. Um, robotics is another area. Now we've we've done um, you know R and D in robotics. Many people are familiar with the, the humanoid robot Asimo. Um, we've done work for for basically research oriented work for 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 a couple of decades now. But we feel we may be at an inflection point now where there may be a possibility to commercialize uh, robotics and actually create profitable businesses around those technologies. And we need a lot of help in that area, to be honest. We've done a lot of research, but when it comes to productizing things, uh, we need help there. So we're looking at robotics-related startups, uh, and particularly now in this situation where, uh, you know, at least I'm not sure if it's a, a, a longer-term trend, but but you know, society is changing in some ways, um, and delivery is is uh, you know more frequent uh, and these type of things and um, automation. If we end up onshoring more uh, manufacturing here and work here. Um, as a general rule, uh, robotics, maybe automation may become more important. Um, and so these are areas that we're looking at. Uh, and then at the same time, we're doing this again, internal reflection exercise to look at, you know, Honda's value and assets and capabilities 
and, and what's emerging in the innovation ecosystem and how we can match that with the strength of our brand, our distribution network, uh, the regions in which we operate. Um, so that process is going on right now internally as well. In in the area of energy, is there something in particular that uh, uh, as as interest? Clearly, electrification is uh, is been happening. You guys have been very active there. But I'm thinking, like hydrogen, for example, uh, uh, of storage and tools. Is there something that you guys are are looking at now? We we do look at um, hydrogen and hydrogen fuel cell related uh, technologies. That being said, there hasn't we haven't seen a lot. Uh, to be honest, uh, at least it's uh, mature beyond research being done uh, in laboratories and that type of thing. Um, we're very interested in, in, again, shared energy, this concept we call of EMOS, uh, uh, and this idea that, you know, creating an ecosystem where of not only shared mobility, but shared energy. That's a concept that we have internally and that we're uh, thinking deeply about. Uh, Off-grid is very interesting to us. Mm -hmm. uh, in emerging markets, we have a very strong brand lots of distribution. Uh, there are obviously lots of needs there. Uh, we have, uh, you know, generators on the market today. Uh, and so that's an area of business that we have today that we could expand. Uh, those are the primary areas that we're looking at in terms of energy. What, maybe it's a little too early to say, but would, do you expect that this process would also imply a change of internal structure as uh, Honda Innovation as it is today? Maybe, maybe rethinking you know, going back maybe to a to a larger CVCs or are there those, uh, you know, uh, kind of too early to tell? I think it's too early to tell, but definitely, I mean, we're not tied to any particular, uh, you know, way of operating. Um, you know, we're really flexible. And again, we're looking for how we can make the most impact for Honda. Um, and, you know, like I said, the last, you know, seven or eight years of it was focusing on this big, um, you know, transformation that was happening around and, and all of these opportunities that were coming around mobility and, and automotive. Um, but now we need to think about new business areas for Honda. Um, and so that's really, I think, where we'll shift to sure. is beginning to look at new businesses and how we can, together with startups, co-create new business opportunities for Honda. Dennis, I would like to conclude more on a, on a note on lessons learned, uh, in particular with the you know, in the framework of uh, the the study that we're publishing uh, for the presence of uh, outposts of innovation, in this case of uh, of Japanese corporates. So, do you have any specific suggestions for entities and corporates from Japan uh, that today are looking at Silicon Valley as an option to expand their kind of open innovation processes? How 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 would would they uh, try to optimize their presence if they were to plan it today? Yeah. Uh, so I think first, just to reiterate, I think it's again important to keep in mind from the from the start that corporate innovation units need to be flexible and evolve over time uh, in response to kind of external market conditions and corporate needs. Um, you know, I think what we've learned as well is that a, a multifaceted, synchronized approach to internalizing innovation works best. So what I mean by this is ideally. You know, open innovation activities, investment and corporate development functions exist as a single unit, or at least there's some type of synergy or alignment that's happening frequently. Surprisingly enough, this doesn't uh, happen at many corporates. There's they're siloed, uh, or they're they're not aligned in terms of how they operate. And you know, there are sometimes, as you alluded to, where maybe going uh, you know CVC heavy makes sense. There are sometimes we're backing off from those activities you know, and looking more at, you know, acquisition makes sense. And so being able to have as many tools in the tool belt as possible uh, is helpful uh, and then setting something up so that it operates in that manner. Um, if one of the goals of the, the corporate of the unit uh, is corporate transformation, um, then this also is a really uh, long term process that takes time to bear fruit. And so also putting a structure in place to enable um, and a unit to operate and have kind of continuity of their mission, despite yeah. organizational changes and other internal changes that occur. I think that's really important. Um, but the other thing is start lean, right? I mean, I think it's important to get in Japanese, they have this word gemba, right? And we think really strongly about being at the spot, at the place. And so not flying out here two, twice a year, three times a year and thinking that you understand 
what's happening in Silicon Valley or any open innovation ecosystem. Hiring somebody local that's that's you know has a similar mindset and really spending a lot of time understanding how the ecosystem operates is, is extremely important. And you don't need to spend to throw lots of capital to do that. Um, but you need to have a certain level of commitment. Uh, if not, it's it's a waste of, of time, in my opinion. Yeah, I no, totally agree. I mean, again, this is uh, pretty pretty clear from our study as well. That is something that it is happening today. There is an acceleration of uh, starting with antennas. That's how you learn. But you need to have some somebody local that would be able to interpret whatever makes sense at the headquarters that are... Uh, uh, you know, it's very different from company to company, from uh, industry to industry, but it starts from understanding and being closer and as much integrated, as you mentioned, with uh, with the local community rather than being, uh, you know, kind of a closed hub because that would, yeah. you know, defeat the purpose. And there's this tendency, again, to see uh, local staff sometimes as, you know, and I hate this word like scout, right? Like this idea you're just throwing opportunities yeah. back to some, mothership in some other uh, other place that's really not a, a sustainable model you really need to find the right talent locally that understands your long-term mission that's you know in it for the long term and can help connect the dots and over time again understand the, the company's needs understand what's shifting and changing and match that with what they're seeing uh here locally when it comes to japan as a whole and as a market and you explain a few success stories of integration of some of the local startups that you filtered and then became uh, part of your ecosystem. But is there anything specific when you're pitching local startups as an opportunity to deal with Japanese corporates that, uh, that you want to share? Yeah, so, I mean, I hate to generalize in a sense that Japanese companies have, you know, all have their own unique DNA and kind of way of operating. Um, there's lots of diversity. Uh, but at Honda, we place uh, really close, a lot of um, value on our close relationships with our partners. So, you know, it sometimes takes us a bit longer than our peers, particularly from other cultures, uh, to commit to something and establish a relationship. Uh, but when we do, we go at it and we see it all the way through. And so having Honda as a partner really opens up a lot of doors for startups because we're a globally rec recognized brand with a global footprint. And, you know, the, the venture ecosystem, I think we've done a good job of educating them. They understand our level of commitment. Um, and that's very helpful uh, for startups. So we pride ourselves in being startup friendly. You know, oftentimes there's this dynamic between corporates and startups that you need to, again, get in, get in the middle and, and make sure that, again, you're really creating win-win uh, relationships. But we do our best to try to uh, facilitate that. Very good. I think, Dennis, thank you so much. I think that's a perfect ending for our discussion. I cannot shake your hand, but uh, the best that we can do is to do <laughs> a virtual high five there. All, All right. right. Thank you. Thank you, Bye.